Well, welcome to El Sobrani United Methodist Church, our Zoom uh, worship on July 17th, and please join us as we sing dance. Dance in the moonlight and dance in the sun. Dance in your discos and dance in your fun. Dance in your disco. 
tiptoes and dance in your briefs. Dance in your doubtings and dance your beliefs. And we'll dance, 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 come dancing with me. Oh, oh. And we'll dance, 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 come dancing with me. Dance with your baby, your dog, or your boss. Dance to the major and dance to the cross. Dance at the graveside and dance at the feast. Dance with the midwives and the other high priests and we'll dance, 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 dance. come dancing with me. Oh, oh. And we'll dance, 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 come dancing with me. People are gorgeous and short ones are neat. Skinny or bulgy, each body's a treat. So dance as you are, you were made by the one who calls you to be what you only begun. And we'll dance, 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 come dancing with me. Oh, oh. And we'll dance, 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 come dancing with me. Dance with your elbows and dance with your hands. Dance with your heart and your endocrine glands. Make funny faces go out of your minds. Find someone near you and bump your behinds. And we'll dance, 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 dance. come dancing with me. childhood and into your teens. Dance with your screw-ups and dance in your dreams. Control and dancing, you make it complete. We'll hug you and kiss you and step on your feet and we'll dance, 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 dance. come dancing with me. Oh, oh. And we'll dance, 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 come dancing with me. Now join us as we sing as the deer. <clears throat>
Amen. Hello, everyone. Welcome one and all to Elsa Bronte United Methodist Church. My name is Reverend Emily Pickens Jones, and what a beautiful day for us to give praise and worship together from wherever you are. That's the beauty of Zoom worship, right? Uh, for all of you watching live, so glad you decided to be here this morning. And for those of you watching later on, I appreciate and thank you to, that you took the time to intentionally choose to worship here at Elsa Bronte UMC. You may notice that someone is missing today. Reverend Eileen uh, is on uh, education leave. Um, it, I, I'm also calling it a vacation, um, but she is at the Hymn Society where she goes every year. And it's the first time they've been able to meet in person uh, since COVID began. And so she and Dan are there. Uh, they're in Washington, DC and having a good time. So uh, we give thanks for those who are filling in for Reverend Eileen today and for the gift of their ministry. So we are looking at profit margins. That's our sermon series that we're doing right now. And these are some important texts that we're hearing. Uh, prophets are truth tellers, right? They're messengers that God sends to help us pay attention. And it's amazing how much of what the prophets are telling the ancient Israelites, how, how much of that relates to us today. And so we are challenged to listen, to look, to take risks, to what, so what if we took the risk to help and see these holy ones of God become our guides, become our traveling companions on this summer vacation that we're on? Uh, we might be troubled, we might be challenged, but we also will be lifted up by what they have to teach us. We might be challenged, but we also will find hope. And we might find a renewed vision that inspires us to take more journeys together. So let us worship. Let's continue to worship. And I invite our liturgist, Ken Kelly to lead us in our call to worship. Take it away. Looks like we're having some problems with uh, Ken unmuting. So we'll give us a minute here. Can you there hear you me go, now? Ken. Yeah, we can hear you now. Please join me in the call to worship. Prophets, what do you see? We see, see the, the many, many ways, ways we distract, distract ourselves. ourselves. What do you see today? We see the good and the bad fruits we have produced. What do you see today? We witness and worship God today, grateful for love and forgiveness. Amen. Amen. A tradition that we have as Christians is to share a passing of the peace. I'm always surprised that there are some churches that don't do this. My, my wife, JC, her church growing up didn't do passing of the peace. And I've always thought it's a really important time, right? It's an important time where we can acknowledge one another. We say that you made it today, you made it to worship, 
Uh, and it, it's so important that we see one another and value one another and remember that we are siblings in Christ. And so we will share that piece with one another today. We can even do it virtually, right? Uh, we have learned a lot over uh, these past couple of years of different sign language things to share in that piece. Um, today, we are just going to be doing a, a peace sign, or you can do a heart, whatever you'd like to do. Um, really, you can do whatever you'd like to show a, a sign of recognition that you are here to worship, and we're happy that you're here. So uh, I say to you now, may the peace of the risen Christ be with you. So with you. And also with, with you. you. Make sure you turn your cameras on so we can see you and wave hi. Good to be in worship with you all. Please join us in our opening hymn, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. scripture this week is found in the book of Psalm, chapter 52. We will read it responsively. In olive tree, in the house of God, but I
Why do you boast, O mighty one, of mischief done against the godly? All day long you are plotting destruction. Your tongue is like a sharp razor, you worker of treachery. You love evil more than good and lying more than speaking the truth. You love all words that devour, O deceitful tongue. But I am like a green olive tree in the house of God. But God will break you down forever. He will snatch and tear you from your tent. He will uproot you from the land of the living. The righteous, the righteous will see and fear and, and will laugh, laugh at the evildoer, evil saying, See the one who would not take refuge in God, but trusted in abundant riches and sought refuge in wealth. But I am like a green olive tree in the house of God. I trust in the steadfast love of God forever and ever. I will thank you forever because of what you have done. In the presence of the faithful, I will proclaim your name, for it is good. But I what the Spirit is saying to God's people. Thanks be to God. Sorry about that. Please join us now as we sing Let Justice Flow. Just the so down, down like a river, down to the valleys where the helpless cry. Righteousness flow through us forever. Lead us to the streams that will never run dry. Flow to the mouths of the hungry. Flow to the hands of the poor. Cry, 
righteousness flow through us forever. Lead us to the streams that will never run dry. The second scripture this week is found in the book of Amos. Chapter 8, verses 1 through 12. This is what the Lord God showed me, a basket of summer fruit. He said, Amos, what do you see? And I said, a basket of summer fruit. Then the Lord said to me, the end has come upon my people Israel. I will never again pass them by. The songs of the temple shall become wailings in that day, says the Lord God. The dead bodies shall be many cast out in every place. Be silent. Hear this, you that trample on the needy and bring to ruin the poor of the land, saying, when will the new moon be over so that we may sell grain? And the Sabbath so that we may offer wheat for sale? We will make the ephah small and the shekel great and practice deceit with false balances, buying the poor for silver and the needy for a pair of sandals and selling the sweepings of the wheat. The Lord has sworn by the pride of Jacob Surely I will never forget any of the, their deeds. Shall not the land tremble on this account? And everyone mourn who lives in it and all of it rises like the Nile and be tossed about and sink again like the Nile of Egypt. On that day, says the Lord God, I will make the sun go down at noon and darken the earth in broad daylight. I will turn your feasts into mourning and all your songs into lamentation. I will bring sackcloth on all loins and baldness on every head. I will make it like the morning of a, an only sun and the end of it like a bitter day. The time is surely coming, says the Lord God, when I will send a famine on the land. Not a famine of bread or a thirst for water, but of hearing the word of the Lord. They shall wander from sea to sea and from north to east. They shall run to and fro, seeking the word of the Lord but they shall not find it. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. Thanks be to God. Join us now as we sing Wounded World That Cries for Healing. Thank you. 
Amen. Thank you, Kairos. Uh, and now is the time where I would like to invite all those who are young or young at heart to come a little bit closer to the screen because this time is just for you. Uh, we have some more to talk about today. Um, I don't know if you remember from last week, but we talked about how we communicate, we talk to each other in different ways, and we talk to God uh, in different ways as well. As we're learning all of these different ways to send messages to others. One way people used to communicate was with one of these. You may not have seen one of these before, but the adults have. Uh, and this is a pager. I tried to find, I have one somewhere. But I tried to find it, couldn't find it. Um, maybe I, I did get rid of it finally. Uh, you know, it's an ancient relic. <laughs> So this, um, a pager, according to the internet definition, is a wireless communication device that receives and displays a phone number. So you would get this phone number on this little screen here, and then you would use your phone to call, to call what that number is. Um, and the person with the pager, you like here's a beep, uh, and that's why some people call them beepers, or there's a vibration alerting that there is someone who's wanting to contact them. Pagers were used before cell phones, that magical time before cell phones. Uh, and they're still used by uh, doctors and people who work in emergency services a lot of the time. When I served as a chaplain in a hospital, I had one. Um, and I have something else with me today. This, I feel like this is like a perfect apple, don't you think? Did you have any fruit for breakfast this morning? I did. Uh, so this is, a, this is a nice looking apple. It's perfect and it's delicious. Fruit is delicious, right? But it's a difficult tool to use to communicate with someone else, right? We can't use it as a phone. I don't think that's gonna work. Uh, maybe we could throw it at somebody to get their attention, but that's about it. But in today's story, uh, the prophet Amos, the same one we talked about last week, uh, is asked by God what he saw when he was shown a basket of ripe fruit. Hmm. What do you see when you see a basket of fruit? You see fruit, right? <laughs> it's kind of a weird thing to say. Um, and so God and Amos have a discussion. God uses a visual of the fruit basket to help get a message across to Amos. God knew that Amos was a bit of a farmer, right? So he used the fruit to help Amos understand the message. What do you see? Amos mentioned a fruit basket, possibly all the enjoyable things related to a fruit basket came to mind. But God didn't see just ripe fruit. God saw fruit that was on its way to becoming rotten. Have you ever seen a piece of rotten fruit? Ugh. It's gross. I hope none of you have any in your fridge. You should probably check. What if I held up a rotten fruit and asked you what you saw? Would you describe it the same way as you did the fresh fruit? The fruit God saw didn't have long before it began to be rotten. God wanted Amos to understand that fruit are like people. 
God doesn't just see the good things that people do. God also sees the wrong choices, the mistakes that people make. God wants Amos to understand that there are both good and bad in people. All of us have a little bit of good and a little bit of bad in us. And God uses fresh and rotten fruit as this example. And so Amos has this enormous job. He uh, has to give this message that people don't want to hear. Sometimes, I'm going to let you in on a little secret. Sometimes God's message to us is difficult for people to hear when they're treating other people unfairly. Have you ever had to say something that might be difficult for someone else to hear? Maybe when you saw someone being mean to someone else, right? There are all kinds of things. Sometimes doctors have to share difficult news or there's all kinds of things. So instead, how can you share God's message of hope, fairness, and love to others, even when it may be really, really hard? There are so many ways to spread God's message to the world. And we can learn from Amos that God's message is so important that we have to do everything we can to help share it. Let's begin right now. Let's pray together. God of communication, we give you thanks for seeing everything in all of us. Thank you for the story of Amos as he understood that he had an enormous job to do sharing your message. Give us each the understanding that we too have the same enormous job to do. Amen. Thanks for being in church today. So once again, yes, we're hearing from the word of God from Amos, a minor prophet that packs a lot of punch. Reading Amos, I really think needs to come with a warning. To interact with Amos is to be confronted with some very real stuff, but stuff that we have to talk about. There should also be a warning for preachers uh, because it's a beautiful scripture with stuff we need to hear, but it's really hard to preach on it. Do you run a lot of risks here? Uh, getting people upset or telling people what they don't want to hear is not an easy thing to do. Uh, and it makes us all uncomfortable, right? we get uncomfortable. Why is that? It's a scripture, right? It's a scripture that we read together as people of faith, and it's foundational to who we are and even to who humankind is. And we'll get back to that in a minute, but first let's take a deeper look into our context. I told you last week that Amos is a unique prophet. Before he became one, he was a shepherd and a sycamore tree farmer. He lived right on the border of Israel and Judah, the two kingdoms of the time that were battling to be God's chosen people. Something's wrong with that sentence, isn't it? <laughs> They're battling to be God's chosen people. That just defeats the entire purpose of what God is doing in the first place. So Amos, he's not seminary trained. He has not been commissioned or ordained. Amos does not have a license to preach, but he takes on this enormous job. And his job is to give a message that people do not want to hear. Quite frankly, he has the kind of job that can get him killed. The powers that be are focused on greed and not God. One of the most dangerous things. The, the king of Israel at the time was Jeroboam. And many of the prophets agree that he is absolutely the worst king of them all. He encouraged and created idolatry. He kept riches to himself. He used power to dominate others and create systems of oppression for his own greed. And Amos, sitting on his farm, couldn't take it anymore. He was over it. He was so done. Uh, he, he knew that God was calling him to do something about it. And God bless him, he did. He went to Bethel, one of the major cities of Israel. Uh, you can see it, it's Bethel on this map here in the blue. So he went from the border to there. And he started speaking. He started talking to people. He started announcing God's message to all. He spends much of the book saying to people, what is wrong with you? You are God's promised people. 
And all you're doing is using your might, your power, your privilege, your wealth. You're doing that all to dominate other people, other children of God. But God solved all of this and everyone went home happy. And we see that no one does that today. The end, right? We can all go home. Are we we're already home? But we can all go on, right? Uh, I don't think so. That would be nice. But no, people keep being really people-y. That's a word. You see, being God's people has the highest benefits that we can possibly imagine, but it is not without consequences. In the same way that a parent might warn a child, if you don't clean your room, you can't go to your friend's house to play. Amos is doing the same thing. He's saying, look at your religious hypocrisy. This is ridiculous. Is this true worship if you are worshiping other gods and your worship doesn't do a thing to help people? The end of the book of Amos, uh, where we're reading now, has four visions, and that helps the people to understand what will happen to them if they do not listen to God. This one today is the third one. The first one is a locust swarm. Second is a scorching fire. Um, we heard about that and then with the plumb line last week, right? Um, third is overripe fruit. And fourth is God's wrath on the temple, which we'll come back to in a little bit. But before we go any further, I want to again remind you of the misconstrued interpretation of God's wrath. We hear God's wrath, we think Old Testament. Uh, many of us say that we like the New Testament because there's a God of love, but the Old Testament has a wrathful God. And this is totally untrue. I don't know how we've totally adopted this, but it, it's untrue. There, there is a God of mercy and love in both parts of the Bible. The God of the Bible is one and the same. And the God of the Old Testament is a God of grace and forgiveness. Why? Some of you might remember, we've talked about it a lot. Because it's the people that keep messing up and doing horrible things over and over and over and over. And that's why I'm talking about it over and over and over again to remind us that people are being people -y. They're being human. They're making mistakes. And yet God still sends prophets, still forgives, still stays in covenant with God's people. God is not being wrathful. And it's really important to hold on to that. But what we learn is that God challenges us. God pushes us out of our comfort zones to the very margins of our lives. God is good. And if God is good, that means that justice and righteousness must be a part of the equation. This is tricky. This is tricky stuff. One time someone asked me a question that really messed me up theologically and I still think about it. If you picked one, is God just or is God merciful? Is God just or is God merciful? Can God be both? I believe so, because I believe God acts in ways that I can't even understand. But when I think about, can you have both of those things at the same time? It's tricky. Does God make people accountable for their actions or does God forgive them? This. This is what Amos is talking about. The behaviors of the kingdom of Israel must be stopped. These behaviors are a carbon copy of what can be found in our modern day practices, right? Uh, many forms of greed. Our whole society, our whole society is based on greed. Having more money, more stuff, more power, more social recognition, more respect. It's important as the church for us to recognize that this is not God's way. We have to sit in that, in that in-between space of being Christian and being a citizen of this world, being a citizen of the kingdom of heaven and the world we're living in. And this is probably the hardest part about being a Christian. By show of hands, how many of you come to church to feel good? You want to hear some nice music, say hi to your friends, right? Uh, hear a message of hope and then go on with the rest of your day. And there's no shame in it. I, I've been there too. That's, I have felt that way, right? Um, I imagine we feel that way because we're longing for 
a sign of hope and a sign of peace and love in a world that is so chaotic. And we do come to church for that because we're comfortable with that. It's what we've always done. But what happens if we get too comfortable anywhere, not just in church? What happens if we get too comfortable? We get complacent. We get bored. We stop engaging. We are creatures of habit. That's why we sit in our favorite pew every Sunday and get upset if someone else is sitting there. It makes us uncomfortable, right? Think about when we first went on Zoom, it was uncomfortable. I, I'm still uncomfortable with hybrid worship. I'm still trying to figure out how to do it. I'm being pushed to the limits. <laughs> I think we all are. Comfortable is such a strange word, right? So what is Amos doing? Well, in our text today, he explains what the guilty party has done, what God is talking about with this fruit and all of that. Uh, he talks about God's desire for justice spirituality. First, the scripture explains what the guilty party has done and declares what will happen as a result. In this case, it's the merchants who sell grain. They complain that they are losing profits from closing shop for religious festivals. They also declare that they have an intention to defraud the customers. The verse text specifies that the targets of the merchant's oppression are the poor and the needy. They're literally saying, let's take advantage of these people because they're easier to dominate because they lack resources or standing to challenge their exploiters. In this, there are some references to Leviticus and Deuteronomy um, that point out that this happens quite frequently. What was odd about my reaction to this personally was I thought, of course this happens. It happens all the time. That's the norm for us. We almost expect to be exploited in this day and age with insurance and Ponzi schemes, uh, pyramid schemes, you know, exorbitant ways that people have learned to take advantage of people like student loans or mortgages, right? We're, we're being controlled by a lot of that. So what is Amos saying here? That in order to be people of God, we have to be uncomfortable? Ugh, I don't know. I don't know, friends. But I do this, uh, the work of our church. Yes, our church, our Elsa Bronte United Methodist Church, we are doing the work of identifying the embodiment of these practices and sitting in their tension, grieving the things that do make us struggle with our comfort. This is a way that we have a chance at offering a tangible gospel-centered alternative way of life compared to the world that we live in. That's really tough. Do we have to be uncomfortable to be people of God? The reality is, it's probably really important for us to be uncomfortable, which I know is hard when we want to be finding a place of refuge where we just want to be inspired and go on with our day. This is why we talk about tough issues on a Sunday morning. This is why in Bible study, we confront very real things that pertain to our lives. Otherwise, what's the point? right? What's the point of going to church unless we are growing, unless we are learning more? Sometimes we have to sit in the discomfort because that's the only way we can get comfortable. Have you ever thought about that? How do you become comfortable with something? You keep doing it, right? <laughs> you keep doing it. Uh, and that's the only way to get over that discomfort. I hope you're following me here because this is really important. And this text uses this image of the fruit basket, as I said. Um, and it's actually a little bit e even deeper than just about the, the ripe fruit and the rotten fruit. And because there's a metaphor within it, uh, and it's a Hebrew pun, so we don't get it as much. Um, summer fruit is translated to Hebrew, it's koitus, koitus. I can't figure it out. I've tried looking it up to see the pronunciation. And so if anybody knows how to pronounce that, you can let me know. So the summer fruit is coitus and the term for the end. So like the end of a movie or something is kets. 
So in the Hebrew of that time, these two words would sound really similar, even though we, we may not hear it. Uh, a few Bible translations attempted to recreate the word play in English. Uh, the New International Version says, uh, the time is ripe for my people Israel, referencing the fruit, right? They, they tried. Uh, and puns like this are really common in biblical prophetic literature. Still, the juxtaposition of such a pleasant image with what God says will happen is so jarring and it's violent, right? So we go from uh, this ripe fruit to violence. Hey. The shock of this intensifies the sense of foreboding created by this vision. God loved Amos's Israel so passionately that God kept talking to her over and over and over again through prophets like Amos, even though Israel wasn't listening. God spoke Amos's uh, eight, the, the, the scripture we read today. These are fierce words of judgment so that Israel would recognize how far Israel has fallen of what God created her to be. God punished Israel so fiercely that she'd come to know how much she'd offended the Lord. But God didn't just see ripe fruit. God saw fruit that was on its way to being rotten. This fruit didn't have long before it began to be no good. God likens this scenario to the people of Israel. God is receiving what the people are giving. God sees the injustice. God sees the oppression. God sees the inequality. God sees the economic injustice. God unfolds for Amos the plan of judgment. Is God just and merciful? In our time, God is thrown into the middle of political wars, religious rivalries, and philosophical theories, right? God always raises up a prophet to represent God's refusal to go along with that oppressive behavior. In Amos, we are able to refute any arguments that God is not a God of the oppressed. Where are our prophets today? Where do you see them? This isn't a call to nation bash, to point fingers and call names. This isn't about blame, but it is a call to truth, to reality. What do we see? What do we see in our neighborhood about the inequities of the distribution of wealth? What do we see in our nation about the inequities of the di distribution of justice? What do we see in our world about the inequities of the distribution of resources? Amos is asking us to take a hard look at the state of our world. And this is a look we too often turn away from. I don't like reading the news because it, it makes me sad, right? Like that's a very deep feeling. It's a very deep feeling of needing to turn away for our own sake. But sometimes we're in denial. Sometimes we claim to be too busy, too wrapped up in our struggles to see beyond our own boundaries. Maybe the way to find the strength to take this look is to begin by looking at where we are trying to make a difference. We talked in Bible study this week about how small groups of people are capable of making a difference. Uh, it amused me that um, I asked, do you, do you believe that small groups of people can make a difference. And everybody said, yes, yes, of course. Do you think that it can make a difference in the world? Yes, of course. And so I said, what about our church? Do you think our church is capable of making a difference in the world? Not so easy to reply to that one, right? But what if we start looking at it that way? How is our church responding to the powers that be We've seen injustice, poverty, greed. How do we face it when we feel so overwhelmed by the world? Do we feel that it's too much for us to handle? Well, friends, this is one man. Amos is one man. And he is going out and speaking. He's a shepherd who speaks to God's love and might. He's going to see what people are in need of. It took 12 men to start the church following the resurrection of Jesus. 12, we've got plenty, right? Compared to that, we've got way more than 12. <laughs> what can we do? What can we do for our community? How can we best serve the community? 
Uh, in September, we've got the stroll coming up, right? The El Sobrante stroll. And that's been a big part of our church, as I understand, for a few years. And I haven't been able to go yet because of COVID. So I'm really excited about it. And when we were talking the other night in worship committee about what, what are some ways that we can talk about the stroll, um, we were thinking about a theme, you know, how can people engage with our church? Maybe we should ask people at the stroll, what are you needing? What can the church do for you? Not, will you come to our church and give us money, but what can our church do for you? I invite you all to mark your calendars for the stroll because I hope you can come. It'll be really wonderful to be able to do this tradition again. The book of Amos doesn't end though with it all being depressing. So don't worry, <laughs> this will go back up here because ultimately God is always there for us, right? So this last vision of the book of Amos, which we didn't read today, uh, talks about when the temple will be destroyed. That's part of what will happen. This is one of those visions. But wait, there's more. Because God says, on that day, I will raise up the booth of David that has fallen and repair its breaches and raise up its ruins and rebuild it as in the days of old, in order that they may possess the remnant of Edom and all the nations who are called by my name, says the Lord who does this. Oops. The time is surely coming, says the Lord, when the one who plows shall cash up with the one who reaps and the treader of grapes with the one who sows the seed. The mountains shall drip sweet wine and all the hills shall flow with it. I will restore the fortunes of my people Israel and they shall rebuild the ruined cities and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and drink their wine and they shall make gardens and eat their fruit. I will plant them upon their land and they shall never again be plucked up out of the land that I have given them, says the Lord your God. How does God end this book? The book of Amos where so many have strayed away and God seeks to punish the injustices. No, God, God makes a new covenant, a promise. There is so much more we, we live into. And while we may want to be living in hope all the time, and we are living in hope all the time, we also have to sit in this discomfort. So think about ways that we can work together to be a presence in our community. Think of the ways that we can speak out to the injustices. Think of the ways that we can make a difference. Amen. Now please join us as we sing Guide My Canoe, Spirit Wind.
At this time, we as a community do something to make a difference. We pray. Yes, even praying can make a difference in our world. It's a time where we name. We name the things that are on our hearts. We name the things that we want to celebrate. We name the things that we feel are important for us to share as a community. And so I invite you to pray with me. At the end of each section, I will allow a time where you may lift up your prayers. You can either do that by just speaking aloud wherever you are, uh, or you can write them in the chat, or you can uh, comment if you're watching later on. What are your prayers? Oh God, you are the hope of all the ends of the earth, the God of the spirits of all flesh. Hear our humble intercession for all peoples and households on earth that you will turn all hearts to yourself and that we may love one another as you love us. Let us pray for our global community. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Let us pray for all who are weary and heavy laden. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Let us pray for those living in the midst of violence. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Let us pray for those living in poverty. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Let us pray for the effort of peace. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. O oh God, remove from our minds hatred, prejudice, and contempt for those who are not of our own racial or ethnic background, nation or political affiliation, gender or sexual identity, and class or creed, that departing from everything that estranges and divides, we may by you make amends, reconcile with one another, and be brought into the unity of spirit. In the bond of peace. Amen. 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 Oh God, as we each come, each individual comes to this community to speak prayers to you, to share with one another, be receptive to all that we carry, all that we worry about when the problems of the world seem overwhelming and it feels like there's nothing we can do. Help us to remember that you are a God of justice and mercy, even though that's so hard for us to imagine how. We pray for those who persist to tell the truth about things that have been covered up. For those who speak to our church's words of truth, challenge, and inspiration. For those who provide hope. Open our ears and hearts to those whom you call to be prophetic voices in our world today. Keep them strong when they are threatened. Be with them when they face danger and death. We pray for those who are not well in body or mind, and we ask you to breathe your spirit upon them that they may sense your loving presence. We pray for those in our families and our church families. Surround each person with your love and healing power. Eternal one, in faith and hope, we humbly lift our prayers to you, spoken and unspoken. In the name of your son, your 
son who is your voice of justice in the world, who taught us to say a prayer uh, in whatever wording or language that is comfortable to you, I invite you to join me. Our creator who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us onto temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. A way that we continue to sit in the tension of being in this world and the next is to build God's kingdom here. It's not something that we wait for. It is an active waiting. It is a way of serving. It is a way of being. It is being the church. And giving is a part of that. We give so that we may do the work of our church, do so much in the community to help one another. And so we ask you to give in any way that you feel comfortable. You can go online uh, and set up automatic payments or give a one-time payment. You can send in a check because our mailbox is always open or drop it off. And we give thanks for your, your gifts, your gifts of presence, your gifts of service, your gifts that are going so far in our community. Let us sing the doxology together to give thanks for all of these gifts. Let us together say our offertory prayer. Lord of all wisdom and patience, help us to open our hearts to what we are able to give. What if we lived as those whose every dollar, every talent, every hour was dedicated to making kindness, mercy, and justice the norm and not the exception? What would it mean if we really saw the places where indifference causes pain, hardship, and harm to souls, bodies, and creation itself? Help us to make this more than a hypothetical, but the reality of an offering of our whole being. We pray in the name of the one who gave his whole self for our redemption. Amen. Please join us now in our closing hymn, What Does the Lord Require of You? What does the Lord require of you? What does the Lord require of you? What does the Lord require? Oh, 
Before I say a benediction, uh, a couple announcements. I invite you to stick around for a time of fellowship following the postlude, where we'll have some discussions. And uh, I'm, I would love to hear from all of you about a time maybe that you were uncomfortable uh, and you were made comfortable afterwards, right? So a time where you felt really awkward in a situation, but the more you were present in it, the more you were dedicated to it the more comfortable you became. So think about that. See if you can come up with anything from your life. Uh, and you, know, you would have seen in the announcements um, that we have a, a special charge conference we need to hold on uh, July 25th. Mark your calendars. Um, we Now that Reverend Eileen has been ordained, um, it, it changes a little bit on how we pay her because we pay her as now a clergy person. And so we have to make that official like we do for my compensation package every year. So we are doing that on the 25th at seven o'clock. And uh, hopefully that won't take very long because at 7.30, we'll have a discussion about the stroll. So the things I was talking about today, if you have any ideas or ways that you wanna contribute for the stroll, uh, stick around after that. So two meetings, one night, get it all done, we can do it. Uh, I also wanna invite you um, to mark your calendars for the 24th, we will be having a see you later party for Ricky Walters. Uh, I'm, I'm not calling it goodbye because it's definitely a see you later as she is moving um, out of town. So uh, hear this benediction. You've heard it from these prophets that are saying all these incredible things, right? Micah, this Micah 6 8 is what we just sang. What does the Lord require of you, friends? Where should we sit in the discomfort? Where do we make a difference? Where can we be like the prophets and speak our truth, speak in the ways that God has showed us? I challenge you to look for that. Look for that in your lives and go in peace. Amen.